Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. <laughs> We are still ostensibly in 1478, Year of the Dark Circle, and we're going to be taking a look at a couple of different books today. The first one isn't technically a book, I guess. It's actually a collection of novellas, or it creates a novella. I don't know what the best way to... I guess it's like four parts of a novella. It's Cold Steel and Secrets by Rosemary Jones. Rosemary Jones is kind of, you know, I really liked that Dungeons book, I think it was, that she did, or maybe it was Citadel's, but everything that I've read since then has been kind of meh from her, so I'm a little frustrated. This one wasn't bad, but it didn't really suck me in that much. The one thing that I was excited to see is that it takes place in Neverwinter, which also Brimstone Angels, which we're going to be talking about today, takes place in as well. And, uh, of course, uh, at least a couple of the Drizzt books took place there. It's kind of weird how the realm seems to, like, focus on certain things here and there. Um, uh, you know, it seemed like at the end of 3rd edition, we were really focusing on dragons and the undead. And that kind of carried over into last time I went way over the last review, but one of the things that I had thought about mentioning is how I don't like dragons or the undead, and so that was kind of one of the things that started to get annoying, and especially the Cult of the Dragon. I was really excited that we had that tease at the end of 3rd edition that uh, the Cult of the Dragon wasn't just going to be undead dragons now, it was going to be live dragons, so at least it wasn't the worst... <laughs> of both worlds for me, but in any case, uh, we are now, it seems, focusing a hell of a lot on Neverwinter, which at least makes more sense, because this was around the time that they were launching the Neverwinter MMORPG, I believe, so of course they wanted to kind of showcase Neverwinter. We've got the Waterdeep books that are showcasing Waterdeep, because, you know, that's everybody's place, right? I, I'm really curious to see, will we eventually get some Selgaunt? I want to see what's become of that now that it's a Shade Protectorate for generations, right? I want to see how what's-his-name is holding up as the ruler, because if I recall correctly, his, like, deal with uh, Rivlin, right, uh, also made him, if not immortal, at least pretty long-lived. I want to see more of the fallout from that, but instead we're in Neverwinter, which is fine by me. The Neverwinter book was one of the few things that I actually bought when 4th edition was coming out, and I really, really liked it. It's a lot of really fun sandbox stuff. Cold Steel and Secrets deals with a lot of that uh, quite a bit. There's this crown, supposedly, that, um, you know, if you go about the right things, do the right spells, and ask the right demon or whatever, you can get this crown that will prove that you are the uh, meant-to-be king of Neverwinter, and that's kind of the whole, I don't want to say point or goal, because it is so sandboxy, but that's kind of the big end goal that you can move toward if you want with the Neverwinter uh, supplement, is that Neverwinter is at this place where it doesn't really have a ruler, and it kind of could use a ruler. So it's like, do you help somebody out? Do you try to become ruler yourself? Etc., 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 and it has all these factions vying against one another. The Abolithic Sovereignty is there, though very well hidden. We've got uh, Neverember, the uh, the known, or the, what do they call him, the Unmasked Lord of Waterdeep. We've got the Nashers, who are the son of Algorond, I want to say. In any case, a lot of different factions, a lot of different secrets, uh, a lot of fun stuff. And this at least delves somewhat into that, and that's kind of cool. And we get a little hint of Fae. I mean, I don't know. This is really just so kind of... I, I guess my problem when you're dealing with things like these where you're writing something that's based on, say, an MMORPG or something like that where you want to get players interested, my problem is you can never really resolve anything, right? Like, Cold Steel and Secrets can't end with the Nashers winning or with one of them being crowned king, right? Because then the meta plot would kind of uh, completely contradict what you might put in your games. And while that's fine, most people don't get that. And so you want to kind of keep your meta plot open enough if you're trying to do a sandboxy thing. I mean, obviously, if you're doing a story, then fine, whatever. But when you're trying to make a sandboxy sort of thing where different factions interact in different ways and there is no winner per se because that's left up to the player. 
then it, it gets a little frustrating reading things set in that area or, you know, that world or whatever. But this one didn't suffer from that too much. This is the other story that I had mentioned before where zombie hands attack. And so I was like, okay, this just has to be a 4E monster. What an odd choice for a monster. But hey, whatever, right? So, uh, yeah, um, like four bucks, I think, because I think they're a buck a piece to download it each. Pretty sure it's only available on Kindle or whatever. That's another thing that we're going to see a fair amount of in 4E is a lot of ebook version only stuff. And uh, that's that's fine by me. I know Candlekeep forums, there are a lot of discussions about, uh, you know, a lot of people just prefer books. And I, I think it should always be an option but I myself prefer electronic books. My main problem with them is that they are, they're starting to get easier to share, but it's like, you know, if I really love a book, then I try to share it with someone. And so like, for instance, the Erebus Kale stuff, I loaned to my girlfriend the Erebus Kale trilogy because that's how I bought Erebus Kale was as that massive paperback trilogy. Then whatever the first one of the Twilight War is, that one I got on ebook and the other two I got uh, paperback. And so it was like with the ebook, I really had no way to give it to her without giving up my Kindle. So I just had to grab another copy and it's like, well, I don't really want to spend more money on a book that I own just so somebody else can read it. And I know there's some sort of share function, and I think it's gotten better and easier to use, but, you know, everybody's so goddamn scared about DRM and blah, 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 and it annoys the shit out of me because it's like, you know, books are, I I don't know. It just, I get it. I get it, I get it, I get it. And it's like with, with bands, you can kind of say, okay, you know, the CDs, the money from that isn't as important as the concert fair and so on and so forth. But what's the equivalent for book authors, right? I don't know. Maybe hopefully stuff like this, getting other people to know about it and getting them excited and interested about it. Then when the new stuff from these people comes out and, and there's no used versions of it, more people will know to buy the new versions. I honestly don't know. I don't have the answer, but I just want to loan a goddamn book out to people if I like it. You know what I mean? And I want to sell it back if I don't like it. Neither of which I can easily do with ebook versions, though I do prefer them because I friggin' love my Kindle Paperwhite. So anyway, that was a little tangent there. I don't know where the hell I was going. Cold Steel and Secrets, man, eh, it's okay. Brimstone Angels, the first of the, uh, what are we up to now? Five Quintology, <laughs> starring Faraday, the Tiefling. It's probably not how you're supposed to pronounce it, but that's the only way that I could think to pronounce it. Let's see, there are so many things that I like about this book. First of all, I said it about Godcatcher, I'm going to say it about this book, and I'm going to say it about any goddamn book that does it. I friggin' love the fact that that our main characters are tiefling twins who are raised by a dragonborn. And uh, what else do we... We have a lot of devils and demons of one sort or another in here. The Abilethic Sovereignty is one of the kind of heavies in the book. Essentially, my point is this is not human-centric, and I love that about a fantasy series. You know, there, there are certain things where it's like, if you're writing a thing where, you know, it, it's just kind of maybe easier to write a human or whatever. I mean, I don't know, like a Abercrombie, Erickson, uh, that stuff is very human-centric. But it's not supporting a world in which it's race agnostic. You know what I mean? Like, the, the realms, if I could run or play in a game that had eight characters and none of us could be human. And there's nothing in the rules that cares about that. Now, obviously, if you're writing a book from scratch, there's nothing in the rules about giving a damn uh, who's human or not. But, I mean, I'm just saying it's good to feel like that's a little more justified, I guess, by having books like this where the characters aren't just all humans. And I really, really enjoy that. It, as I said way back when about Salvatore, and I'll always give him credit for this, it feels like I'm in a fantasy world, and that's kind of cool. So, Brimstone Angels. The title is explained, I don't know, maybe halfway through the book. I don't know if anybody cares. Uh, essentially, there are, I think, 12 lines of uh, tieflings, basically. Because tieflings are all kind of somewhere in their lineage. Someone had sex with a devil. And, uh, the uh, you know, and it's like they've all got Asmodeus' blood in them somewhere. 
but it's which one of Asmodeus's like 12 sons and daughters or whatever you can trace them back to. And one of them, like Bargar Kakistos, I believe, that's the uh, that's the father. It was anybody who comes down from them, from him, it's rare for some reason that isn't disclosed, or at least I didn't catch it, um, and they are known as Brimstone Angels. Our main characters are Faraday and her twin sister. Everybody calls her Havi. It's short for something. Uh, Havi, anyway. Fer- Faraday and Havi. Hobby, however you want to say it. Havi, Nagi, Hobby. Anyway. Uh, they're twins and they're raised by uh, Men- Mene? Mene? Mehen? Something like that. Anyway, he's a dragonborn. I-, I always get confused with his name because he likes to swear in Draconic and he says Mehenish. That's what his name is, I think, Mahen, because he swears Mahenish. And so it's like, you know, a grandfather goes, God damn it, all the time, and his name is Gadamit or something. And it's like, that's a little odd, but whatever. And uh, Faraday, in the prologue, kind of just, I don't know, having a bad day or whatever, makes a pact with a devil, devil, demon, devil, yeah, devil, named Lorcan. And so there's all this sort of witchy magic sort of stuff and blah, 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 blah. It's, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. There's a lot going on here. And that was actually my biggest problem is somewhere around 80% through, because I have this on the Kindle and I check my percentages all the time. Somewhere around 80% through, I realized I don't have a goddamn clue who they're fighting or why. Like I could give you... You know, names, like there's the aptly named, like, queen bitch demon Invadia, who wants to invade, (laughs) I think. There's Rohini, who is a succubus in disguise as a priestess at the House of Knowledge in Neverwinter, and she is apparently spell-scarring orcs, and she dominates like everyone she says, and Mahen actually gets kind of wasted as a character in this book, not wasted as in drunk by being dominated through most of the book, you know, and, and there's a, oh, what's her name, Sarnash or something like, Cerche, I think, uh, Lorcan's sister, who's trying to win away his tiefling, and it's like, so I could give you, like, 37 bad guys, but I'm like, I don't really know what any of them want, or how they play together, or what anything that the protagonists are doing is going to mean, in the end, it's like, what is winning? What is losing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I really lost track, and I got to the end, and I was like, I don't I don't know what the hell happened the last 20% of the book. But I really enjoyed the characters, and I really enjoyed most of the story, and I really liked uh, the glimpses we got to see of Neverwinter. One of my favorite little sections is just a couple of people at Neverwinter, like like a guy goes into a store, and he gives some stuff to the, the shop owner, and they have a little discussion and then when he leaves he's like hail asmodeus oh hail asmodeus <laughs> it's like these just devil worshiping shop owners it felt very league of gentlemen to me i guess and i really enjoyed that i have some quotes because i know everybody loves quotes here are a few quotes the first one made me angry he lends books to havilar that's what it is Havi is short for havilar he lends books to havilar and me sometimes havilar and i dear faraday bitter tongue as criella continued so this is what made me hate Criella more than anything, is not that she corrects her grammar like a pedant, because I do that all the time, but because she is wrong. She is absolutely wrong here, and it pisses me off. And I'm assuming Aaron knew that and put it in to make her more hated for those of us who are grammar junkies, but uh, the way to kind of always tell if that's right or not is just take out the first part of it. So instead of Havilar and me... Replace it with me and see if it still sounds right. He lends books to me sometimes. Well, yes, that sounds right. He lends books to I is wrong, obviously. She is mistaking um, uh, that sort of grammatical rule where sometimes it's going to sound weird, but it's correct uh, for just saying, oh, whenever you say and me, it's wrong. But that is incorrect. This is a direct object and it should be me. So screw you, Criella. The next quote is... An example of how much I really love the interplay between the sisters here. And not just the sisters between each other, but the sisters and every other character they interact with. I mean, the dialogue just feels much more naturalistic. And I don't necessarily need naturalistic dialogue, but it flows so much better in something like this. And especially 
you know, I, I, the second edition stuff was the worst about this, right? Where people's interactions would be told, not shown, and the kind of joking interaction through dialogue was just terrible. It would be like, oh, 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 what a mighty fine jest thou hast made, or whatever. Here, this is from Bryn, who's another character's point of view. The second devil girl strode up and planted her bloodied glaive, tilting it away from her. Eater of her enemy's livers, she interrupted with a wicked glee. I just thought of it. Her twin glared up at her. Not now. Why? She seemed to notice Bryn. Oh, well met. Is he dying? No. Good, she said. Then, eater of her enemy's livers. The first devil sighed. No, it's too many words. The second girl scowled. But they're all the right words. It sounds pretentious. You mean glorious. So, I love this little bit. You really get Javi and Faraday's interaction and, and their relationship with each other so well. And you get to, to feel the character of Javi just pouring off the page. And how Faraday always has to be the good girl and how tiresome that is and so on and so on and so forth. And it's funny. I mean, it's cute. It, it should have been awesome instead of glorious, but whatever. I mean, I guess they felt that was a little too out of place for the, like, medieval time frame that the realms is in. And the third quote that I'm going to share, the third and last quote, I love, 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 love this. I hope you guys appreciate this as much as I. I'm going to put in Lorcan in brackets here, so uh, because it just starts with he and it wouldn't make any sense. Lorcan here kind of questioning everything that he's done and kind of realizing, like, do I actually care about this person, etc., etc., etc. Lorcan pulled himself up and limped to the nearby tower, a cracked and damaged thing still being built. And when I first read it, I was like, oh, that's such a shitty modifier. What does it mean? And then I was like, oh my god, it means both. I just... It's those little things that really, really, really make reading worthwhile for me. I don't know if it's the same for you, Hopefully it is. If you think a little silly, that's totally fine. It's been a long week. Give me my small pleasures, all right? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, next uh, next time we're going to look at Fall of High Watch and Sword Mage, which Sword Mage I've read part of, and I know that I liked it. Sword Mage was the one that I thought, oh, this feels silly, and it doesn't seem to fit with everything that I know about D&D up to now. So it'll be interesting to see, do I make it through it this time? Because I just stopped. Basically, at the first fight scene, I remember little things about it. We'll see if they actually uh, are how I remember them. What did you think? Not a sword mage, obviously. Don't comment on that here. Comment on that on the, on the video when it comes out. But what did you think of these books? I think most people agree that Aaron is uh, one of the best writers that the Realms has. Did you enjoy them? Did you like Cold Steel and Secrets for reasons that I totally didn't talk about? I absolutely love hearing feedback. Uh, there are two things that I kind of hate, and I'll maybe mention them some other time, but I would love to hear what you guys think and what your own experiences are. This is meant to start a discussion as much as being a review. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered. <laughs>